Welcome and good evening. I'm Samuel Caldwell. It's my distinct pleasure to serve as the Chief Diversity Officer and Associate Vice President for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University at Albany. Joining us this evening is the 20th President of the University at Albany, Dr. Albany, Dr. Javidan Rodriguez, the 15th Chancellor of the State University of New York, Dr. John B. King Jr. And welcome to Leading Questions. We're very pleased to have a very robust conversation planned for this evening. Welcome Chancellor King. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. We'd ask that you please uh, take advantage of the opportunity to share any questions you may have using the Q&A <clears throat> using the Q&A feature. The chat function is disabled for this evening's program. However, you can take advantage at any time to send questions in using the Q&A function. Uh, there may be questions that arise for you um, over the course of the conversation. There may be some things that you already have in mind. You can absolutely take advantage of the opportunity to send questions at any time. We'll be answering your questions or providing them to be answered a little bit later in our program. Um, I'd also like to let the audience know that uh, there will be starting with a, a, a little bit of a poll, which is typically how we kick these discussions off. So Chancellor King, our poll question for this evening is how does a leader overcome adversity? Uh, you do have that question available for your audience. So please take advantage of the opportunity to scroll the responses and whichever one resonates with you most strongly, we'd ask that you take advantage of the opportunity to select that. How does a leader overcome adversity? And we have about 40 seconds or so left for you to provide your response. One thing that we know um, occurs over the course of anyone's leadership journey is that there are going to be things that are going to come up that we don't anticipate are going to come up. They may be related to situations. They may be related to individuals. Uh, but when those challenges arise, we have an opportunity to face them in a way that seems most authentic to our management and leadership style. So whichever answer seems to Again, resonate with you most strongly, please feel free to select that. And then let's see what is coming up for us by way of results. So we do not have a majority. However, the one that seems to resonate most strongly, well, actually two seem to kind of be rising. Um, one, turn that adversity into an opportunity to seek community or the counsel of others. And also in the running is seeking additional information or knowledge. Seeking additional knowledge or information seems to be there. So thank you audience very much for participating there. Uh, I'm looking very much forward to hearing your thoughts on the results, Chancellor King. Uh, for now, I'm going to excuse myself for a short time. Enjoy your conversation with President Rodriguez. Um, I'll be handling some incoming questions from the audience, and we'll be back in the latter part of the program with students Shania Yearwood and Joshua Chan, who will be helping out with our lightning round and audience question and answer. Thank you very much, President Rodriguez. Thank you uh, very much, Sam. It's a pleasure to see you as always. And to our audience, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon in leading questions. Chancellor, as always, it's a great pleasure uh, to see you. Uh, welcome to our program. And once again, congratulations on your selection of as the 15th Chancellor of the State University of New York. I know you just started in January, but it seems like you've been at it a, a, a lifetime. Uh, welcome, Chancellor. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate the opportunity to join you. Thank you so much. And so for the audience, we're going to have a, a series of questions, which I'm going to pose to the chancellor. We're going to do this as informally uh, as possible, but um, we have a series of questions. We might not be able to cover them all, but we'll certainly uh, uh, cover quite a few of them. And as soon as uh, Sam 
pops up back on the screen, Chancellor. It means our time is up and we'll move to, to the next session. So Chancellor, just to, uh, to start the conversation, um, as you very well know, SUNY is the largest comprehensive university system uh, in the country. And it's a very diverse system, starting with community colleges all the way up to uh, doctoral and research one institutions and a whole series of institutes, types of sectors uh, in between. So it's a very complicated and a complex system. Uh, and they all have their individual leadership teams and their own president. And so, you know, it's hard enough to lead one institution, let alone 64 institutions. So why did you apply to, to and accept uh, the position of SUNY, of SUNY Chancellor? And what do you expect to achieve in this role? Yeah. Well, thank you for the, for the question. You know, the SUNY mission, right, the history over 75 years, uh, being really an engine of opportunity for the state, uh, delivering generations of New Yorkers access, not only to educational opportunity, but economic opportunity, uh, readiness for citizenship. Uh, it's extraordinary. And so I was most compelled by what SUNY is about as a community of institutions, uh, certainly in the conversations with the Board of Trustees and the governor uh, there, uh, alignment around the idea that SUNY can and must be the best public higher education system in the country uh, was very appealing to me and their commitment to put resources behind that. Uh, the governor demonstrated last year in her state of the state and the budget uh, that she was willing to invest in that vision of SUNY as the best public higher education system. And, you know, having spent my whole career as an, as an educator, um, having worked as Secretary of Education for President Obama and thought a lot about the role that public higher ed plays in our uh, country. I was excited about the opportunity to uh, lead this incredible community of institutions. And it is a pleasure every day, literally every day I talk to students and alumni, as you know, President Rodriguez, whose lives have been changed. Mm -hmm. First generation college students, new Americans, veterans, uh, who are coming back from their service and, and finding a path forward through SUNY institutions, uh, working adults who are coming back to school to advance in their careers, uh, just folks who are finding their passion, uh, not sure what they want to do, get to a campus like U Albany and discover what they love, what they want to spend their lives doing. It, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be a part of an incredible community. So, Chancellor, on a related question, um, I've been at three university systems, and I think you're doing something that is quite remarkable that I've never seen done before. You have uh, challenged yourself uh, to visit all 64 campuses by the end of this semester, which is a major, major challenge. I think you might be close to halfway already. That's Why right. Did you decide to do this because, in addition to all that, you got a state budget that's being negotiated and approved. You've got tons of other things. What led you to do this? Yeah. Well, look, it's an it's an incredible opportunity to learn. Um, you know, I think one of the important kind of leadership tasks is to make sure that you are doing a lot of listening and really coming to understand what the opportunities and challenges are within an organization. And so I'm, I'm 33 visits in, number 33 today, uh, into my 64 campus tour. And it's been incredible. And, you know, at every campus, I, I talk with the campus leadership team, talk with faculty, talk with students, talk with employer partners. And you get a sense of the tremendous diversity across our institutions. Not only the diversity of the students, but the diversity of the missions you know, from uh, what's happening at the research university centers to what's happening at an environmental science and forestry uh, to what's happening at uh, Maritime, which is almost like having a service academy within, within the SUNY family of institutions to community colleges that are serving vastly different communities. It's really uh, a, just a rich array of institutions. And I, and I get to hear, um, you know, the things that are working, the close relationships students feel with faculty members, the student supports that are in place, uh, but also some of the challenges, uh, sort of some of the capital challenges, some of the resource challenges. 
Uh, and that's all information that I can carry into the decision making at system, but also in the arguments that we're making uh, with the legislature and the governor around the need for investment. Mm -hmm. So you're over 50 percent. We'll continue, yeah. To, yeah. We'll continue yeah. to uh, follow you because through your visits, we're learning a lot about uh, the institutions mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. right? Through the, did you know, uh, questions that are being posted in LinkedIn and Instagram and in other areas. So it's just a great learning opportunity. Uh, Chancellor, uh, in, in quite a few forums uh, that I've heard you speak, you've constantly referenced to the fact that um, that public education saved your life. What do you mean by that, and, and, and how so? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, both my parents were New York City public school educators their whole career. Uh, my mom came to the Bronx from Puerto Rico as a kid. Uh, my grandmother came to New York, a single mom, uh, tried to find a path to opportunity, worked in a, in a garment factory. Uh, my mom learned English in the New York City public schools, went to Hunter, part of the CUNY system, became a teacher and school counselor. My dad, who was um, African-American, the grandson of enslaved people, uh, grew up in a very segregated New York City in the early 20th century, also found a path to opportunity as a teacher and principal. They both spent their lives in New York City public schools, but they couldn't have known the difference that New York City public schools would make in my life. Uh, they both passed away when I was a kid. Uh, my mom, when I was eight, and a heart attack. Um, I lived with my dad. My dad was quite sick with Alzheimer's. Home was incredibly difficult. I didn't know what my father would be like from one night to the next. Some nights he talked to me, some nights he wouldn't. Uh, over the years, he, as he got more and more sick, I had to take on more and more responsibility at home, figuring out how to get food in the house, how to keep our household going. Uh, my dad passed when I was 12. Uh, I don't think I would have survived that period um, without the amazing teachers that I had in New York City public schools. And they made school a place that was safe, supportive, nurturing, and a place where I could be a kid when I couldn't be a kid at home. Um, and even after my dad passed, and I moved around different family members, different schools. It was always teachers who gave me a sense of hope and purpose. And so that's really shaped my whole career because I, I became a teacher really to try to do for other kids what teachers had done for me. I started my career as a high school social studies teacher and as a middle school principal, just, just trying to make school uh, that kind of safe haven for other kids that it was for me. Uh, and that led ultimately to becoming a state education commissioner for New York and secretary of education and, and now to the role of chancellor. All of it has been about trying to, to uh, maximize that transformative power of education. And I, I know it so well because of the difference it made in my own life. And so it's quite remarkable that given the, the challenges and life experiences that you had early on, that you were able to move along this path and achieve what you have achieved, right? From, as you mentioned, uh, U.S. Secretary of Education and now the 15th Chancellor of the SUNY system. So, you know, congratulations. And, and as, um, uh, as a fellow Puerto Rican, uh, you know, we, we, always, we always welcome the success of, of, of all Boricuas, all people from Puerto Rico. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Elsewhere, right? You know, uh, Chancellor, SUNY uh, is, uh, has such a, a diverse uh, student body, right? Racially, ethnically, uh, geographically, politically, socioeconomically. As you know, U Albany is one of the most diverse research one institutions uh, in the country. So, how do you, as chancellor, uh, work to ensure that the education uh, that students receive uh, reflects that diversity? And why is this so important to you? Because I know this is another of your major topics or issues you've been focusing on. That, that's right. You know, I, I always say to folks, you know, I think there are four pillars to our work to ensure SUNY is the best public higher education system in the country. Uh, student success, uh, research and scholarship, economic development and upward mobility, and then importantly, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that has to be everybody's work. That has to not just be up to the chief diversity officer or the 
the EOP director, everybody's got to be focused on making sure our student body is diverse, our faculty is diverse, our leadership teams are diverse, and all of our campuses are places of belonging. And this work is under attack nationally. Uh, there, there are states, uh, we have governors who are telling people they, they shouldn't even use the word diversity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we have a, a particular responsibility in New York, given our history and our tradition, to stand up for diversity, equity, inclusion, and to say that, that fulfilling that vision means students have to see themselves reflected in the faculty and leadership of our campuses. And we've got a lot of work to do there. Uh, our faculty is not as diverse as it should be. We've got about 4% African-American faculty, 3% Latino. That is not nearly enough. We have a lot of work to do there. Uh, our leadership teams, um, need to evolve to become more diverse. You, President Rodriguez, were involved in the creation and design of the Hispanic Leadership Institute, which is helping us propel uh, Latino staff and faculty into leadership roles. And we are working with the legislature, hopefully to create a Black Leadership Institute as well, modeled on that same idea that a community of practice, a community of mentoring can help people move into leadership roles. And then the curriculum, has to reflect diverse voices. And I'm so proud of our faculty who have stood up to this uh, national uh, anti-DI movement. And we have faculty who are saying, in my class, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about diverse authors. Uh, we're gonna read Toni Morrison. We have faculty members who are saying, you know, in my class, we're gonna have the hard conversations about our history, whether it's around slavery or Japanese American internment or, uh, uh, depriving uh, Native Americans, Indigenous Americans of their land. Um, you know, the hard parts of our history have to be confronted if we're going to build a healthy democracy. And I so appreciate we have faculty standing up for that. And our board of trustees has committed that every student at every student campus will have exposure to themes of diversity in their uh, educational experience before they leave us. That might be in a history class, might be in a sociology class, might be in a public health class, might be in a communications class, but we're going to make sure that all of our students are prepared to enter a diverse workplace and a diverse society. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think given what's happening at the national level, as, as you indicated, and given what Ruth SUNY is doing in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, this provides SUNY and all our institutions to clearly take a leadership role and serve as a national model in the space of diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. Uh, Chancellor, I think you know in all our lives there are there there are there are these times uh, that are turning points that are defining mm -hmm. moments in our life that really make a significant change in terms of where we are and where we want to be and how do we get there, right? So as you reflect about in uh, in your experiences, your childhood, etc., is there a particular turning point or a critical point that you would like to share with the audience that you said really turned you around in terms of what you want? to do and yeah. let you to where you are today. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, even the things that happened in my childhood, uh, like many kids who've experienced trauma, uh, I struggled in high school a lot um, and really struggled with uh, adult authority. I was really angry uh, about the things that had happened to me as a kid. It felt like adults had let me down. And I got in a lot of trouble. I got in so much trouble, I got kicked out of high school. I always point out I'm the first United States Secretary of Education who been kicked out of high school. Um, and my, you know, my life could have gone in a lot of directions at that point. And I went to live with my uncle, who was my father's youngest brother, uh, my uncle Hal. My uncle Hal was career Air Force. And he had uh, been a Tuskegee Airman and was one of the first African-American pilots in the U.S. military during World War II. Uh, came home from World War II, couldn't get a job as an accountant, which was his training because he was Black, and decided to become a firefighter, risk his life on behalf of other people. He was a firefighter and then uh, went back into the military uh, in his career, Air Force, ultimately retired from, from working at the Pentagon. So, he was a tremendous example of um, patriotism, um, 
but considered patriotism, understanding the complexity of our country, but still believing in the values of democracy. And I went to live with him and his wife. They ran a tight ship, my uncle Hal and Aunt Jean, which I needed at the time. I hadn't really had structure since my mom passed when I was eight. So that was really powerful. And I remember we had a conversation where my uncle Hal said to me, you know, neither you nor I can control the things that have happened to you in your life. But you now have to decide what kind of man you want to be. And that powerfully uh, affected me, you know, he, hearing that from him, given the adversity he had endured and the choices he had made, um, you know, really affected me. And it really helped me find a center and find a path forward. Um, uh, my uncle Hal and Aunt Jean, they just, they, they were very important in my, in my life and helping me get back on, on track. Well, thank you for for sharing uh, your your experiences and thoughts uh, about that, and certainly they got you on the right track. And so uh, that's critically uh, important. Uh, Chancellor, you know very well, probably more than anybody, uh, people have very different perspectives and views on education in general mm-hmm. and higher education in particular. How do you as chancellor, given that you're talking with elected officials, you're talking about with community representatives, you're talking with donors, all with different perspectives about the role, the value and the impact of higher education. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage those competing perspectives and thoughts um, and so that you can move the system forward? Mm. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's certainly a challenge. I think, um, you know, you try to do two things. I'm sure. I'm, you know, I'm. I'm sure you do this, and because you're you're connecting with each of those constituencies, constituencies as well. You try to tell the story of the institution, right, and the story of the impact, because you know whether you're a legislator, a business owner, an alum, when you hear the stories of our students, uh, the challenges that students have overcome. And then the incredible successes and achievements that they have, you can't help but be inspired. So I think part of it is trying to trying to bring people together around a common understanding of the value proposition that SUNY represents, the difference that SUNY makes in people's lives. But the other piece that is, I think, critical to leadership is you do a lot of listening and try to help, try to hear uh, what it is that people are hoping for and help them see the role that SUNY is playing. You know, so sometimes I'll talk to legislators and they're really worried about economic development. They're really worried about, are we gonna be able to lead in a new green economy? Are we going to be able to lead on uh, preparing for the consequences of climate change? And so I can say, have you seen the incredible work on atmospheric science that is happening at U Albany? Mm-hmm. And do you know how important that is to the wind industry and informing the wind industry as they plan for increased power generation through wind? You know, have you have you visited our environmental science and forestry school and talked with students who went to uh, Puerto Rico after the last set of hurricanes? Mm-hmm to try to make a difference in helping the island move towards greater energy resiliency and building local grids and thinking about how do you manage the damage that is caused by these natural disasters? You know, have you talked with Sam Whittingham, who's a Nobel Prize winning researcher at Binghamton, who's Mm -hmm. doing nation leading work on battery technology, where we know that that battery technology is essential to making renewable energy work and uh, could be a key part of economic development in the Southern tier of New York. And so you try to help people see that the thing they're passionate about actually is happening at our SUNY institutions. Right. And they may not know about it because it's not always visible, but but we try to share that. Exactly. You know, and in that context, um, uh, as leaders, we're always making decisions, right? Uh, sometimes very complicated decisions, some which might be popular with some, many which are not popular at all, right? Mm-hmm. And as mm-hmm. chancellor, you have had to make and you will continue to make difficult decisions. But as you think about your decision-making process, is there a particular issue, decision that you make, that you made 
that that really stands out for you even today? And how did that you manage that situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you one example. Um, when I was secretary, one of the things that I focused on was trying to crack down on predatory for-profit colleges. Now, these are colleges that uh, they sell a promise to students, charge them a lot of money, but then don't deliver quality. And a lot of those institutions uh, were allowed um, particularly during uh, the 90s, early 2000s, to grow tremendously and to enroll thousands upon thousands of students who were getting taken advantage of, who were ending up with debt, no degree. Uh, sometimes they, they promised that a program was going to prepare students for a particular career, and then they wouldn't even have an approved set of courses or prepare the students for the, the assessment that was required for entry into that kind of career. Um, so we really focus in, in the Obama administration on trying to take on those institutions. And it was one of the things I spent a lot of time on. And there was one very large one, ITT, the very large predatory for-profit college. And we had to decide whether we would take a series of actions that would cause the institution to close. And the dilemma was there were students enrolled and it was going to be really hard. We were going to have to do a lot of work to help those students transition to other institutions, to help students understand that they were being taken advantage of and that they, they would be much better off attending, for example, a, a SUNY institution. Um, and that was a hard decision, but we ultimately decided that we couldn't allow that institution to continue to take people's money and burden them with debt that they'd never be able to pay back. Mm -hmm. And so we shut down the institution and then we put all of our energy into trying to make the students whole, trying to uh, help students recover from the financial impact of being taken advantage of, and also help them transition to other educational opportunities. Uh, but it's very hard and, and, and painful. Uh, but, I, but I think ultimately I tried to keep as the North Star what is in the best interest of students. And I think... For all of us as educators, if we keep our North Star, what's best for students, uh, where, where that's, that's what's going to lead us to the right decisions. Great. Thank you so much. I know that Sam is about to pop up here in the screen in a, in a minute or so. But before we go there, I, I really want to ask you a question, which I think it's uh, important for our audience to hear your response. What is for you uh, the critical uh, importance of being a national leader? Uh, actually a very successful national leader who has transversed all these roles, but who also happens to identify as an Afro-Latino. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, you know, Valerie Jarrett, who worked with me in the Obama administration, she used to say, uh, you can't be what you can't see. And I just think it's hugely important that we have diverse leaders across our institutions. And um, it's so meaningful for students, for young faculty members to see leaders like you, President Rodriguez, to see leaders uh, who are diverse. And it's important for our, our, our students of color, but it's also important for our white students to see diverse leaders and to know that there's this diverse community of adults who cares about them. Um, you know, I also think uh, I take very seriously a responsibility also to help mentor others and to help, you know, try to, as you know, as they say, lift as we climb, right? Try to help others have access to opportunity as well. And it's why I so appreciate the commitment you've made to supporting the Hispanic Leadership Institute, because you've really said, uh, not only do I want to be an example, but I want to help other people have access to opportunity. And, and I certainly am committed to trying to do that as well. Thank you. So do you have a particular leader or role model that you look up to? Um, you know, so many. Um, I will say, I think a lot about my fourth, fifth, sixth grade teacher, Mr. Osterweil, who was the teacher who, if not for Mr. Osterweil, I, I, I literally wouldn't be alive today. I wouldn't be sitting here today. And what he brought to class every day was uh, passion for 
sparking students' curiosity and love for students. And I remember the things we did in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, like it was yesterday. We did a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare in Elementary School, amazing. Uh, we did a production of Alice in Wonderland where I was the rose with big red felt petals sticking out of my head, right? I remember those things so clearly because his classroom was this place that sparked um, energy and passion about learning. I remember going to the Museum of Natural History uh, and going to the ballet. You know, the field trips that we took were always about sort of exposing us to a world beyond Canarsie, Brooklyn. And so I think a lot about him when I think about what does it look like when our institutions are at their best, that spark of, of inspiration uh, and that sense of safety and security. If we can, if we can deliver that for our students, then, then we're doing our jobs well. Thank you, Chancellor. And I'm going to ask uh, Sam to jump in now. <clears throat> but your comment uh, should remind us all that whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not, the, the, the huge, significant, and transformational impact that we have on student lives, even when we're not realizing it, uh, that, right. that we, we as leaders are impacting people uh, in many so many different ways. And so I think that's something important for us to be aware of. Chancellor, it was a pleasure uh, having this conversation uh, with you, and we look forward to having some more uh, conversations. But now I'm going to pass it on to Sam. Thank you Thanks so very much. much. Thank you so very much, President Rodriguez, and thank you, Chancellor King. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome to our panel uh, UAlbany students Shania Yearwood and Joshua Chan. Uh, Shania is in her second year in excuse me, graduate program in the School of Education at the University of Albany. She is from New York City, a uh, proud Brooklynite. And we're also joined by Joshua Chan, who is a junior majoring in political science at the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy. Joshua is from Brentwood, Long Island. And Joshua also serves as the Senior Director for Government Relations on the SUNY Student Assembly. So welcome, Shania. Welcome, Joshua, as well. Uh, they're going to be posing questions uh, for you in just a moment, Chancellor. And um, before they do that, we're going to pivot to the lightning round. And I guess it must be an attribute of senior leaders. Uh, you've actually already answered the first question. So we'll, we'll ask the question and then we'll reflect on the response that you've already provided, which was as a student, which grade did you enjoy the most and why? And it sounds as if your sixth grade experience between safety, security, energy, passion, and exploration uh, seems to kind of be the grade that resonated most strongly with you. So thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, we'll move on to the balance of the lightning round, and we'll just ask for the response that comes to mind for you most readily. Uh, please fill in the blank. My favorite band or musical artist is? Oh, wow. Huh. <laughs> uh, well, how about one of your favorites? Wow. Wow. Uh, Lauren Hill. Okay. Best, best album ever. Yeah. Her, her first you. album. Best album ever. I, I had I, that, that one is, is, is a regular. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, scenario You're forced to take a two week vacation, no cell phone, no laptop, no visits to SUNY campuses as compelling as those <laughs> would be. Where do you go? Hmm. Well, I'm sort of torn, torn between two. Uh, I love being in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, it, it brings back so many memories from when I was very little and I, I would go with my mom. Uh, and I taught there at the beginning of my teaching career. So I, I love that. Uh, but one place I've always wanted to go is, is to Greece. And I have never been. And I would love to go. Uh, there was this movie like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Yes. And, they, and they were in Greece and they were on these like, these incredible cliffs, these houses on cliffs. And I always, I always think about that and think to myself, oh, that's a place I would love to go. Well, my, 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 my colleague and friend, our vice president of student affairs, Michael Christakis, is from Greece. I'm sure he'd be happy <laughs> to offer a recommendation. Okay, or, nice, nice. Or even three relatives <laughs> of some things you might take advantage of when you make your sojourn to Greece. Um, best characteristic in a leader. Mm. Empathy. I, I I think trying to see the world from other people's perspective 
He's mm. just critical to being an effective leader. Thank you. Uh, most challenging characteristic in a leader? Mm. Most challenging, meaning, meaning something that makes it hard for a leader to be effective? Someone that makes it hard for their for those under them to follow. Yeah. Uh, ego. If it's mm. all about them, they're going to end up, you know, leading a parade with no with nobody behind them. Com- completely understand. Last program you've been binge watched in part or in full. Oh, interesting. Um, huh. I just started Madam Secretary. Um, uh, but my my binge watch strategy, I, I tend not to watch it all at once. I just I make it the thing that I watch while I exercise because then I'm more motivated to exercise because I want to get to the next episode of the certainly. Of the show. Well, th- thank you, and thank you for the tip as well. And we just have two more. Um, I suspect it's the ability to navigate your way to dozens and dozens of campuses, but I'll hold off. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Oh, hmm. Superpower. Uh, I think probably time travel. You know, I started out as a social studies teacher. Like, I think it would be so cool to be able to, to have a front row seat at some of the important historical events. Thank you very much for sharing that. And our final lightning round question, um, what book or what what would be one of the books you'd recommend for every um, aspiring leader, uh, mm. college students to read? Yeah, there's a, tr- a fantastic book. It's called Leadership Without Easy Answers by Ron Heifetz. Mm. And the the main premise of the book is that the role of the leader is to help a community adapt And that means really what you're doing is helping a community bridge the gap between their values and their reality. And I always like that because it's not about the leader having the answer. It's about the leader helping the community to find the answer. Um, And I think that's a very powerful frame. Thank you very, very much for participating in Lightning Round. Uh, We have a number of questions that our audience has put forth. And our students have questions prepared as well. Um, I'm looking at the time and looking at the questions. I'm not quite sure how we're going to reconcile it. But I'm going to ask Shania and Joshua to ask you the question that they find the most compelling. And I know that they've uh, prepared a couple. um, So I'd ask our scholars, um, who I thank again for their participation this evening, to ask whatever question seems to resonate with you most strongly uh, this evening. And why don't we start with Shania? Hi, Chancellor King. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So my question for you for this evening is, um, do you think the schools in New York City offer things that the schools in the greater New York area do or vice versa? Do the schools in the greater New York area offer things that you can't find in New York City? Mm. Interesting question. You know, I think... um, you know, one of our challenges in New York is that with 700 school districts, um, we have some places that are very uh, non-diverse. And, you know, when you think about uh, New York City, uh, so many of the schools in New York City give students a- experience that is diverse. Although even in, within New York City, there is a degree of segregation that is really worrisome. So I, I think one of the, the things that I think we have to work to do, maybe in some of the more suburban or rural communities, is find ways to create that exposure to difference that, that might happen more organically you know, in the city. The, the other thing I would say is that because, the, because New York City has so many schools, uh, they are sometimes able to offer some um, kind of focus opportunities that are harder to recreate. So I think about a school like LaGuardia 
you know, folks have seen the, the show or the movie Fame, right? You have this school that's this incredible arts institution. We've got some other examples around the state, Rochester School of the Arts, for example. Um, but sometimes it can be hard in a in a smaller high school to have the range of offerings. You know, you may have a dance class, but you might not have 10 dance classes with people who've been dancing on, you know, in, in the great um, ballet companies of the globe, the way that you, you might at LaGuardia. So that, that's, that's a, that's a challenge. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Joshua. I'm sure you have a question as well. Yes, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you again, Chancellor King. I know we spoke at the SUNY, uh, Friends of SUNY reception back in the in the well of the LOB. So it was yeah, amazing. To see yes, you. yes, good to see you again. Good to see you again. So my question, um, so it, I just some, some context. So Chancellor King, you have held so many positions during your lifetime. You've overcome hardship and struggles, which I can empathize with. Uh, I grew up in a town called Brunton, Long Island. Uh, it's a town that struggles with systemic racism and systemic poverty. 89% of the students in my 17,000 school district student population district are economically disadvantaged. That's 17,000 plus families in there, uh, and students that are on some sort, of, some sort of social assistance program like SNAP, SNAP benefits, Medicaid, or free or reduced lunch. And I'm one of those students. Um, and a member of my family is affected by this. As chancellor, you know, I understand you have, you have to guide your way through this, navigating all of, you know, these taking this all in as students through college are navigating the system. Uh, as chancellor, what will you do to ensure that students who live paycheck to paycheck who struggle with food insecurity and students with broken homes are able to see SUNY as a beacon of light and a way to free themselves from the broken economic system that pulls them down. And how will you be ready to tackle this? Because as you know, all these issues are so intersectional. So Sorry, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, it's I look, it's the thing that it's one of the things I think about every day. You know, I I think you know part of what we have to do is create community that is supportive. And it's one of the reasons why I think the EOP program is such an important part of the SUNY community. Um, when I visit campuses, I'm always shocked that EOP students will talk about the EOP director, the EOP counselor, the relationship, the safe space that's created within the EOP community, um, the support from EOP students who are maybe a class or two ahead of them who help guide them around classes and advice about uh, the transition to college. So that kind of support uh, for the students who are most economically vulnerable for first generation students, I think is hugely important. And, and, and it shouldn't be limited to EOP. Uh, EOP represents that, but we ought to figure out how to create some of that sense of community and those supports for the students outside of EOP as well. You know, some of it is financial. And, uh, you know, I, as, as um, the head of the Education Trust, the civil rights organization I led before I came to this job, I was part of a, a, a national coalition working on double Pell Grants because, you know, in 1980, Pell Grants accounted for 80% of the cost of a public uh, higher education degree. Now it's about 28%. So the diminished, the, the diminished value purchasing power of Pell Grants has undermined um, our access to higher education as a country. It's put the burden on students and their families. So um, increasing Pell Grants, raising the income threshold for TAP and Excelsior, you know, those are things we can do to address some of the financial challenge for students. Uh, and then there's all the basic needs in security, food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation, uh, lack of access to transportation, childcare, you know, so those are things all of our campuses are working on. And, um, you know, and I, I know President Rodriguez thinks about these issues a lot, you know, trying to figure out how do we have not just food pantries, but help students access SNAP benefits? How do we help students um, find affordable housing? How do we work with our public transportation agencies to make sure that there are opportunities for students to use public transportation um, effectively between school and work and home. Uh, we have childcare on many of our campuses, not all of them. It's not always as affordable as we would want. So uh, we're trying to tackle those uh, wraparound service issues as well. So there's a lot to make sure that our campuses are places students thrive. But I, you know, I, I will say, you know, you Albany, if you look at the data and ask where are the institutions where 
uh, African American students are completing at a higher rate? What are the institutions where Latino students are completing at a higher rate? U Albany is at the top, at the top of the list, and I I'm, I was saying that before I was SUNY Chancellor. You know, when I was at the Education Trust, we were highlighting U Albany for leadership uh, in completion for students of color. I think that's really important. Chancellor King, thank you so much for, for bringing into this discussion the notion of social mobility. Um, it, it's, it's something that I know is very meaningful to our students, meaningful to our alums, and certainly meaningful to the leadership team as well. Um, I believe Shania has another question, so we'll pivot to that, and then we'll go to the audience questions. Shania? Yes, so my other question is, of the various positions that you have held, which do you feel has had the greatest impact on others and which one has had the greatest impact on yourself in terms of personal development? Mm. Well, I'll take the second question first. I always say the hardest job that I have had was being a first year teacher. Uh -huh. It is a lot of work to figure out the first time you're teaching, you know, how to make, class good, how to make the materials good, how to how to set up the, the class dynamic the right way. Uh, and you're doing it for the first time. You don't have any experience to lean on. Um, and that's probably the hardest I've worked, the most tired I've been, uh, mm -hmm. but also just grew tremendously from the experience of being a, a first year high school social studies teacher. Um, in terms of impact, it's really hard. It's very different, you know? When you're a secretary, you're, the, the scale of impact is extraordinary, but you're not as close. You know, when I was a middle school principal, you know, I, I knew all our students and I knew their families and I was constantly giving feedback to our teachers on instruction. I was kind of in it with everybody. When you're a secretary, you're so far from the, the school level. So it's just different. So it's hard to say most impactful. Um, yeah, uh, there is, there is, yeah, yeah, that's just different. It's different. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you very much. Um, Shania, Joshua, thank you so very much for your engagement. Uh, we appreciate so very much having you here this evening. Absolutely. And we promise the next time I'm in a space where I'm asked to come up with some very compelling questions, uh, I'll be reaching out to you. So thank you very much for uh, for joining the conversation this evening. Please stay, please stay for the, for the stay here for the balance of of the questions. Uh, we do have a question from the audience. Uh, we attribute this question in, to Tyra Chancellor King, and the question is that me, uh, mental health among marginalized populations, mm. um, particularly students, it, it is a growing issue. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of approaching this personally? And how, as a system, might this be something that we approach even on a going forward basis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such an important question. And there's, you know, look, we had uh, mental health challenges pre-COVID, uh, particularly for students who've experienced trauma. And, and um, but then COVID exacerbated those challenges, created new challenges, the period of isolation. You know, I, I, my, my daughters during the year when, when schools were all virtual, um, I had a daughter who was a 12th grader and a daughter who was a ninth grader. We were tremendous privilege. That year was brutal, um, so hard. For my daughter who was a senior, none of the rituals of senior year, she's an actress. She couldn't act, she couldn't do the things she loved, so hard. For my ninth grader, she knew to high school and was in class all year with kids and teachers she'd never met in the real world. So with all our privilege, still it's incredibly different. Then you think about the kids who are food insecure, housing insecure, kids who lost loved ones. You know, we have tens upon tens of thousands of kids who lost a parent to COVID um, or a caregiver to COVID. Uh, you think about kids who um, were in homes where there's domestic violence or addiction, and what that meant that they didn't have that school opportunity as a safe haven. So there's a lot um, 
to make up for, and we're seeing the consequences on all of our campuses. I think we're seeing increases in anxiety, depression. Uh, we've certainly invested a lot of resources. I think something like $24 million of the federal relief dollars were invested across our campuses in mental health supports. Uh, I've been advocating for the legislature and government to give us more resources to address mental health issues. We built a telemental health network, leveraging our practitioners at SUNY Downstate and SUNY Upstate, two of our medical centers. They're doing telemental health across about 53 of our campuses now as an added resource, uh, but we need more. And I also think we need to think systemically. So we need more counselors, we need more direct mental health support, but we also have to think about what are the systems that help build relationship, that help build connectedness, uh, so that our, that our communities are, are nurturing the mental health and well-being of our students. Thank you so very much, Chancellor. Um, the next question is uh, thematically, around the issue of diversity uh, within the, the, the teaching faculty. So this question would be attributed um, based on feedback we received from a couple of people um, in the audience this evening, um, including Dee, uh, thank you very much Dee, including Bianca as well. And the question is really focused on this whole notion of the measures that are being taken relative to recruitment and retention to, mm. to bring mm. in and maintain uh, diverse talent uh, in the teaching faculty uh, within the SUNY system. And you mm -hmm. shared some statistics with us a bit earlier. Um, the University of Albany enjoys relatively um, uh, a, a space where our faculty diversity, um, although it's something we're working on, um, is more diverse as an institution than perhaps the, the system at large. But what measures come to mind for you relative to priorities in terms of recruitment yeah. and retention? Yeah. Well, two things. I mean, uh, this is a, it's a challenge for us, it's a challenge for the country. Um, Black and Latino faculty are underrepresented consistently across our institutions, private and public. Uh, one of the things I think we need to do is have a stronger pipeline. And so that starts even with investing in undergraduate research opportunities, making sure our graduate programs are diverse, that they are intentional about recruiting diverse students, admitting diverse students, providing them with the financial aid they need uh, to be able to attend, and then creating pipelines where uh, doctoral students postdocs uh, have an opportunity to, to start to enter into the teaching pipeline. You know, Stony Brook has just launched a new effort where they will recruit diverse STEM scholars as postdocs, and they will have a two-year postdoc period. And if they are uh, successful during that postdoc period in their teaching and scholarship, they will automatically uh, receive tenure track assistant professorships. And I'm very excited to see how that initiative plays out. I think we've got to do more to build that pipeline. I worry about the Supreme Court and the decision that we're going to see in June around affirmative action and what that will mean for our efforts to diversify. But I think we've got to invest in the pipeline. But then there's the work around retention. And there, I think, Communities of support are so important. You know, uh, I mentioned President Rodriguez's leadership around the Hispanic Leadership Institute. One of the th things I've noticed about the Hispanic Leadership Institute, it's a community designed to help people prepare for leadership opportunities across campuses, but it's also a community of support for each other and uh, an affinity group, if you will, a network of people who are facing shared challenges and can share experiences. And we have to do that for our faculty of color. We've got to make sure that people are, have that connection to communities of support because there is an invisible tax on educators of color. Uh, there's an invisible tax in um, trying to navigate uh, whether it's microaggressions that people experience or stereotypes that people experience. But there's also a tax in terms of if you're one of a very small number of faculty of color, then you end up 
on a lot of committees because people say, oh, we need this committee to be diverse. And so there's not that many faculty of color. You get drawn into those committees. Um, students, understandably, uh, students of color are looking for mentors. And so they're going to go to that small number of faculty of color. And, and so that can really make it difficult for a faculty member to navigate their own scholarship, things they need to do for tenure, and all those community responsibilities. So we've really got to be thoughtful about support uh, for our faculty of color if we want to, to retain folks. Thank you so very much, Chancellor King. Uh, I am amazed at how quickly the time passes when we have these discussions. Uh, I'm going to ask if I could uh, for President Rodriguez to offer any final reflections and then Chancellor for you to do the same before we go into final wrap up, please. Thank you, Sam. All I want to do is uh, express my sincere appreciation to the Chancellor uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon and for entertaining the multitude of questions that we've posed to you, including the, the lightning round. I also want to express my appreciation to Shania and Joshua uh, for, for being with us uh, uh, this afternoon, as well as, as Sam and all the, uh, the folks that have worked, particularly Mary Hunt and Joe, that have worked to make this event possible. And certainly thanks to, to our audience. Uh, Chancellor of the University of Albany looks to continue to work with uh, SUNY in addressing the very same issues and challenges and opportunities that you've discussed here today. So we're looking forward to your continued leadership. And once again, thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Look, you know, I um, I just feel so blessed to have this opportunity to, to, to have this role of chancellor and to be a part of this community of 64 amazing institutions that are changing lives every day. Uh, inspired Shania and Joshua by both of you. Uh, look forward to hearing about your continued successes and impact. Uh, Sam, we're grateful for your leadership within the UAlbany community. Uh, President Rodriguez, you know, I just, it's, it's having admired you and uh, sung your praises before I even knew you, the opportunity now to, to get to work alongside you is a real privilege. Uh, and, you know, look, we have, we have challenges, right? We have work to do to diversify our uh, faculty and leadership across the system. We have work to do to um, make sure that, that students who struggle and end up leaving us stay. We got work to do on retention and completion across our institutions. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the opportunities so outnumber the challenges. Uh, the future of the state's economy, the future of our democracy depends on the work we do in the SUNY system. And uh, I'm grateful to be a part of this fantastic UAlbany conversation. Thank you. Chancellor King, thank you so very much for your commitment to public service. Thank you for your leadership of SUNY. Thank you for sharing parts of your personal journey, your experiences, your insights with the University at Albany community this evening. Um, it's been our great pleasure to host you. Uh, President Rodriguez, thank you as always for your uh, steadfast commitment to supporting uh, the institution, supporting the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Shania, Joshua, thank you so very much for your great questions this evening. Uh, your university at Albany Education is, is, is paying dividends and it certainly paid dividends for us this evening. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the partners who collaborated to make this evening possible, the Office of Government and Community Relations, the Office for Public Engagement, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the School of Education, Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy, and of course, the University at Albany um, Information Technology Services field support staff. Uh, Mary Hunt, thank you so very much for the work that you did to bring this to pass and also, to the Office of the President as well for their support. And audience, thank you very much for joining us for this edition of Leading Questions. We look forward to engaging in future discussions in the future. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great evening, all. Take care. Good night, everybody.